Good morning, New Hope Online. Happy Mother's Day. I hope that you guys enjoyed that awesome video that we just watched. And I hope that you and all of your families are doing great on this beautiful day. I know me and my family, we are doing well in this quarantine time, in this social distancing time. We're trying to take advantage of every opportunity to go outside with this beautiful weather. And uh, just really enjoying the extra time as a family, trying to find the silver lining in this situation that we all find ourselves in. But one of the things that I find myself missing the most is gathering together at church. I look around and this place is empty and I miss you all. And I think one of the things that I miss most about coming together is just being encouraged. Hebrews 10.25 says, Let us not forsake gathering together, but rather let us encourage one another as the day of the Lord draws near. Let me encourage you. Even though we are separated by miles, we're in our own homes, Let me encourage you to continue to be a relational church. God has given us a lot of different tools and platforms where we can stay connected with one another. And so right now, wherever you're watching, if it's on Facebook or whether it's on YouTube, would you just comment in the comment section? Maybe say hi to someone who is watching that you miss. Maybe send a text message or give a phone call today, but let's continue to stay connected and be the church and be relational in this time as we wait with anticipation and expectation of the day that we can return together here and worship together. Turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter six, and as you turn there, I just wanna pray. God, I thank you for this time that we can look into your word, look at what Jesus has to say, and I pray that your spirit would speak to our hearts, that you would reveal things to us, Lord, that we wouldn't just ingest information, but we would apply what we feel in our hearts from your Holy Spirit, God. And we love you. We give you this time. Speak through me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. This morning, we're going to be talking about the spiritual discipline of fasting. Now, for some of you, when I say that we're going to be talking about fasting, your mind instantly goes to food or dieting. Others of you instantly think, well, I can't fast because I'm diabetic or I'm on a certain type of medicine. And others of you instantly think that fasting is this archaic practice and it's irrelevant for us today, while others have no idea what I'm talking about fasting. Whatever your thoughts are about fasting, I just want to encourage you to open up your mind for the next 20 minutes or so and allow God to speak to you about about what the discipline of fasting might look like in your life. Fasting uh, is something that doesn't get talked about a whole lot in Christianity today, but I believe that it is one of the most important spiritual disciplines that a follower of Jesus can have, and, and it helps us stay in tune with God. And at the end of today's sermon, I'm going to call our church to a fast. It will look different for all of us because we're all at different capabilities of what we can fast, and, but I want us to all be open to fasting something and so that we can be unified in spirit and in purpose. And during this message, allow God to speak to you. What can you fast from? But before we read this text and we look at what Jesus has to say about fasting, I just want to give you a simple definition of fasting, and that's this. It's giving up something that you want to tap into something that you need. It's giving up something that you want so that you can tap into something that you need. Fasting is not meant to be a manipulative move to get God to give you something that you want or that you desire. Fasting shouldn't be done for the physical benefits even though there are physical benefits. And and, and fasting done for any other reason besides a spiritual purpose and drawing close to God is fruitless. We fast earthly things so that we can feast on godly things. You might be interested to know that nowhere in the Bible records a law or a command of a regular fast, but in the Jewish culture and history, fasting is a discipline that has been take uh, that has been going on for many, many centuries. Esther instructed Mordecai to fast on her behalf. 
Daniel fasted from delicacies. The king of Nineveh ordered a fast for his entire nation after Jonah went and warned them of God's coming judgment. And Nehemiah fasted after the temple walls were fallen down. There are many more examples of people fasting before and after Jesus' time on earth. But let's turn our attention to our text today in Matthew 6 and see what Jesus had to say about fasting. Matthew 6, verses 16 through 18. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men that they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. See, I want you to notice in verse 16, Jesus' words. He doesn't say, if you fast. He doesn't say that you shall or you have to fast, but he uses the word, when you fast. There's this anticipation or expectation that Jesus brings to the table when he's talking about fasting. He assumes that a follower of God would be someone who might fast. Hear me this morning. If you consider yourself a Christian, then you really need to pray about and consider and think about what the discipline of fasting looks like in your life. Perhaps an even stronger case for fasting is found in Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 and 15, where Jesus answers a question. In verse 14, it says, Then John's disciples, talking about John the Baptist's disciples, those following John the Baptist, came and asked Jesus, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is still with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. Now Jesus was referring to himself as the bridegroom. This may seem weird or a little bit foreign to you, but Oftentimes in scripture, the church is referred to as the bride, and Jesus is referred to as the groom. And so Jesus was essentially saying, look, the groom is here. He's with his bride. Come around me. Take all of me in. I have ushered in the kingdom of God. Be in my presence. Be filled. There will come a time where I leave, and, and, and you'll wait for my return. It's when I'm gone, that's when you will fast. But right now, be with me and take me in. The first thing that I want you to know this morning and see is that Jesus held some sort of expectation or anticipation that his followers would fast. He never commanded it, but the way that he talked about fasting, it leads us to deduct that he would encourage it and support it. Now let me remind you briefly what the definition of fasting is. It's giving up what you want in order to tap into something that you need. What we all need is Jesus. And while Jesus was physically here on earth, the disciples had everything that they need right in front of them. They could take all of Jesus in. But now Jesus has gone away and he's preparing a place for you and I in heaven, but he sent his Holy Spirit down here on earth so that we could stay in communication with God. And so by staying in connected with God, we need to be full of the Spirit, and this is where fasting comes in. We give up the things that we want, such as entertainment or food or delicacies or social media, and then we replace the time that we would spend on those things, and we replace them with godly things, such as reading God's Word and meditating on it, praying, worshiping, thinking about the Lord. Each time your your stomach growls when you're hungry or you pull out your phone and you're tempted to scroll through Instagram or Facebook, we remove and replace that craving. We say, Jesus, create in me the same hunger that I'm having right now in my stomach, but let it be to spend time in your presence. God, in the same way I naturally reach for my phone, may I naturally reach for your word. God, as I crave this activity, God, as I crave this food, oh, how my soul longs to be in your presence. Create in me a new heart, God, and let me be hungry for you and not the things of this world. Fill me with your spirit. It's about getting hungry for God. The best way to stay hungry is to get hungry. 
But there are some things we need to learn not to do when fasting. Take a look again at verse 16 where Jesus says, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they are fasting. Now it's interesting that it's recorded that Pharisees often made it a habit of fasting on Mondays and Thursdays. And the reason why they would fast on Mondays and Thursdays is that was market days. And so they would walk around looking all somber and there would be a larger crowd to admire them for their godliness. Jesus is calling them out and he's exposing their motives. Do you think that the hypocrites received much spiritual benefit for fasting in that sense? Of course not. They were not doing it for the right reasons. Hear me, when you fast, you need to do it for the right reasons, to be closer to God, to tap into what you need. We don't need to post on social media that we're fasting social media. We don't need to post that we're fasting food or we're doing this or we're doing that. And I'll take it a step further as we're in this time of crisis, you know, and and there's a lot of good deeds and positive news that's going around of feeding the homeless or giving money or giving of your time. You don't have to post every good thing that you do in exchange for a handful of likes when God says your reward is in heaven and he's laying treasures and crowns and jewels and things we can't even comprehend in heaven for us. Let your right hand not know what your left hand is doing. We don't need to boast in our works as the hypocrites. Just do it, draw close to God, and move on. I remember the first time that I tried to fast. I decided I was going to do a two-day fast of water only. Now, for me, giving up food isn't uh, a, a huge deal um, as it would be for sleep. Some of you guys, you know, you can go on four hours of sleep and be just fine. I, I need like eight hours of sleep, but I can skip two or three meals and be just fine. And so I wanted to kind of ease into my way of fasting, and I thought, you know what? I can go a day without eating, no problem. I don't think that that would do me much good. I'm going to go into two days. So I did this, and after the fast ended, I felt like nothing changed. I, I didn't have this big revelation from God. I didn't feel like God spoke to me. I didn't, I didn't have this incredible spiritual encounter, and, and it left me feeling a little bit frustrated and confused and and, and really just, just not really knowing how to feel. D- disappointment, really. And it wasn't until a couple days later when I was praying that the Lord revealed to me, and he, he spoke to me. He said, Austin, you missed the point of fasting. See, during that time of not eating, I just replaced my mealtime with other things, whether it was homework or hanging out with other friends or watching mindless TV I was not intentionally replacing the time I would normally be spending time eating with doing things that would draw my attention and my focus on God. I think that the number one mistake or temptation when fasting is to replace whatever you're giving up with something other than God. You'll see this sometimes with people who have an addictive personality. You'll see an alcoholic who no longer is addicted to alcohol, but they become a workaholic or a fishaholic or whatever else um, they might fill their time with. We tend to replace flesh with flesh when God is asking us to replace flesh with spirit. Now this may seem off topic, but a little known fact about me is I like NASCAR. I enjoy watching NASCAR. I wouldn't call myself an avid fan, but I do typically follow who's in the lead points-wise in the uh, season. I know who's usually won the last race. I don't always get to watch it because Sunday afternoons can be a little hard for me. Um, I've been to two NASCAR races down at the Kansas Speedway. Uh, Jimmy Johnson won the first race. Uh, Kyle Busch, boo, um, won the, the second race. He was on fire that season. And there is not much more exciting than sitting up close to the fence and feeling the occasional debris, smelling the race fuel, feeling the rumble of the engines, and just the excitement of a field of 30 plus cars go flying by you at speeds of 160 plus miles an hour. And every time I go to a race or I watch a race, I am absolutely amazed at the precision of those vehicles. 
the absolute precision that these vehicles operate at. In fact, NASCAR has actually had to create limits and guidelines for all of these racers to follow to keep speeds at a safer speed and to govern them down and to keep the field a little bit more competitive. The difference in thousands of an inch could be the difference between a a race car's car driving at full capacity versus less than. And, and I used to think, well, race car drivers are just guys who like to drive fast. That couldn't be anything further from the truth. These guys are engineers and some of the most bright-minded people in the automobile industry. It's, it's incredible. I once heard an interview of a driver, and the person doing the interview asked the driver and said, what is the secret to going fast? And the answer absolutely blew my mind. The driver said, braking. The key to going fast is braking. Braking into a turn helps you accelerate out of a turn. Braking helps you find your lane. Braking helps you maintain control. Braking prevents unnecessary correction. And when you get to the straightaway, you are able to reap the benefits because you braked in the turn. Braking makes you go fast. I believe that some of you are sensing a turn in your life, and and you're sensing this change in your life, and you feel like you're ready for it, but God is saying, hey, let's slow down a little bit. Let's find our line. I, I don't want you correcting mistakes made now down the road. I don't want you to be reckless after this season of breaking. There's going to be a straightaway, and I want you to fly. I wonder if God uses fasting to slow us down, to refocus, to recalibrate, to realign with God's ways and his purpose so that he can launch us out of the turn into the straightaway. Think of major decisions that you've made in your life. Maybe it's purchasing a car or a home or switching an occupation. or Maybe it's relational and and handling different relational problems or maybe it's who you marry or whatever it might be. What would life look like if you would have taken some time to slow down, to fast, to realign and recalibrate your thoughts so that you could see of the situation how God sees the line in the situation? Now, the answer to that question might be a little bit speculative, and if you're married, you're stuck with your partner, so probably not the best uh, road to travel down, so to speak, Um, but Fasting, nonetheless, allows us to be on the same page with God, and then we get to reap the benefit of not making corrections later on down the road, not digging ourselves out of debt that could have been avoided if we would have just prayed about it, not having relational turmoil or whatever it might be if we would just slow down so that God can show us the way. Now, maybe you've watched a NASCAR race, or maybe you've just seen the movie Cars 3. But many of you are familiar with the race technique called drafting or bump drafting. Now this is where two cars actually work together and they drive extremely close. They used to lock up and they sometimes still do. And the cars actually work together. I won't bore you with the science and the physics of the front drag and the back drag. But what you need to know is these cars are driving so close that aerodynamically they're able to work more efficiently and go faster than they could if they were driving alone. I'd imagine that fasting is like the time in the race where two cars partner up and they link up. You have to slow down just enough for you to link up. God is the lead car and he is the one who finds the line and and sets the pace and makes the move. And we just get to link up with them and go faster and more efficient than we ever could by ourselves. Are you willing to slow down so that God can take you faster? Now, although Christ never commanded us to, he expected fasting to be something we do. But he didn't just leave it there, he demonstrated it. In Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, record the same story where Jesus went into the wilderness and he fasted for 40 days and then Satan came to him and tempted him. And the way he overcame temptation was by quoting scripture at Satan. Matthew 4, 4, Pastor Brian read last week in his message where Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. 
I think of John chapter 4 when the disciples brought lunch to Jesus, assuming that he would be hungry. And in verses 32 and 34, kind of paraphrasing, I have food to eat of which you do not know. And Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work here on earth. See, this was not some clever metaphor. This was Jesus' reality. Jesus was, in fact, being nourished and sustained by the power of God. Jesus knew that, that food does not sustain us. God sustains us. When Jesus fasted, he was actually feasting. See, Jesus fasted so he could feast, so he could go fast. Do you think that when he went to the wilderness and he fasted that he just spent their time looking somber? No, he spent time in the word, in the Torah, in the law. He spent time seeking God's face, drawing close, being filled with the spirit so that he could live a life that God wanted him to live. And from that, he launched into his ministry and he was flying around that corner into the straightaway all the way until his final mission of dying on the cross for our sins, for you and for me. As we close today, I want to discuss, I want you to discuss what you are going to fast with the people that you are watching this with. And if you're watching alone, then just take a moment to commit something before the Lord. Not all fasts are going to look the same this week. If you've never done a water-only fast, I'd encourage you to only do one day. Uh, and maybe uh, you've never done a fast at all, and one meal is going to be uh, a stretch for you. But whatever you do, I want there to be enough of a sacrifice where you miss what you're giving up, where you can remove and replace the thought of, oh man, I wish I had this for God. Give me more of you. Replace my desire for this for a desire for you. If you're with your immediate family, I want to encourage you all to partake in a fast and spend time together praying for something. Me and my family, I plan for us to fast one meal. Now having a, a one-year-old, a three-year-old, and a five-year-old, meal times are very important times in our family. And this is gonna be a test, but it's also an opportunity for me to be able to talk with my young children and say, look, there are lots of kids your age that go hungry night and day. This is an opportunity we get to pray for our missionaries, that we get to pray for people that, that need a, a revelation of who God is and, and that are lost. And we're gonna take that time and we're gonna worship and we'll be sure to teach our kids in that time. They're not gonna die during that time. It's not abuse. It's teaching them to hunger and thirst for the things of the Spirit. So I'd encourage you families, do something together as a family and let those times together be meaningful. I'm asking our entire church body to fast for these two things. The first and most important thing is that God would make us people that live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. May we love the things that God loves. May we see the way that God sees. May, may we think in a godly way. Would we more accurately represent what Christ looked like while he was here on earth? I'm reminded of Matthew chapter 17 when the disciples came to Jesus and said, man, we can't get this demon out. We, we did it in your name. We did everything you told us to do. And Jesus said, this kind only comes out through fasting and through prayer. See, it's not this magic trick. It's being so full of the Spirit of God. It's being extra saturated where the Spirit of God, where people experience freedom. In that I want people to experience freedom in my presence. I want to be so full of God that I'm not missing opportunities to pour into people's life, to, to sprinkle some water on dry bones. I want to be someone who represents Christ well. I'm reminded of Dick Brogdon, and he shared at our missions convention when he walked by in an Arab country, he felt the evilness as these two gentlemen walked by him, and he could just feel and sense the heaviness that they were walking with, and he shivered. And then he had this thought, do other people feel a lightness and do other people feel the same spirit of God in me as I just experienced on the opposite side? So let's be a people of the spirit. That's the first thing to pray for. The second is to pray for those who are affected by this virus, those who need a physical 
touch. I believe um, there's only one person in our immediate church who has contracted this virus. Right now they've got mild symptoms. We're praying for you. We're praying for many of your, your friends, cousins, relatives, co-workers. But let's pray that God would bring hope and bring healing and bring light into this dark situation. We're praying for financial relief for those who are self-employed, for those who have been affected in different ways. We're praying protection around those who are continuing to work, those who are vulnerable. And I pray specifically that whoever comes up with the vaccine is a Christian, and not just a Christian by name, but a strong Christian, where even the money that is to be earned from this vaccine that, or, or cure, that it would be donated and it would be given and that they would give glory to God. And so I'm praying that a Christian would come up with this so that God, you can get the glory. And so join me in those efforts for being more person, more of a people that are spirit-filled and for those affected in the virus. And maybe there's something else that your family wants to fast for or about. Maybe you need wisdom or you have a wayward family member or, or you're struggling in some sense. Whatever the reason might be, remember the purpose is to draw near to God and to tap into what we need, which is more of him. See, if you need wisdom, God is the source of wisdom. So we don't seek wisdom, we seek God and wisdom is the byproduct. As we seek God, we might see things change. We will gain endurance and the ability to endure our difficult times. We might understand a little bit more. We might become encouraged as we seek God. All of those results are byproducts of getting closer with God. So I ask you, what will you give up so that you can tap into what you need? Let me pray for you. God, I thank you for everyone who is watching. I pray right now that you would reveal things in our heart that we might lean too much on, God, and that you would expose those things, that we would live without them so that we might understand what it truly means to live with you as our source of strength and our source of life, God. I pray that you would pour out a spiritual blessing on everyone who partakes in this fast, God. And I pray that this week would be an absolute feast of your presence, of your word. And I just pray a blessing over everyone, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now I know that not all of you watching might understand why a Christian would give up something just to be closer to God. But I wanna let you know that Jesus gave up his life so that you could be close with God. God loves you, and he wants to bless you. And becoming a Christian doesn't mean that all your, your troubles and your trials just disappear, but it does mean that you have access to the person of peace, that you have access to a joy that surpasses the circumstances of life. You have a strength and the ability to endure difficult times, and God wants to forgive you of your sins. There's nothing that you've done in your past that he won't or can't forgive you, and he wants to bless you and set your feet on a new path. And so if you've never asked Jesus to be at the center of your life, you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins, and you've never put your trust in his plan and his ways and have him put your feet on a new path, would you just repeat this prayer after me? God, I pray that you would enter my life. I trust in your plan. I follow you all of my days, God. Forgive me of my sins. I turn to you change my heart, change my mind, change my thinking, and help me live for you, God. I receive your salvation, I receive your forgiveness, and now I give you my life for all of my days. Help me love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, I put my trust and hope and pray. Amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, I just want to ask you to do this one thing. Would you send me an email? austin at newhope.church. And I want to be able to pray for you and with you, and I want to be able to send you some materials to help you in your walk with God. And I hope that you'll tune in next week to continue. God bless you all, and we'll see you next week.